Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we are continuing in a series, uh, the subject is Heaven. Uh, this is episode number 15. If you've missed the previous episodes, they're all available on uh, my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. And obviously, uh, each episode is two hours long, so we've already discussed heaven for 28 hours. And to, to many people, that could be shocking. Maybe even to us on the panel, it's, it's hard to believe that there's this much to say and learn about heaven. Uh, but it is it, this study is very comprehensive. We're, we're looking at heaven from every possible angle. And we're probably about halfway through this topic now. We're using this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven as a kind of a guide or outline as we go through uh, this study. Uh, first, let me ask the panelists to introduce themselves and say hi to everybody. Start with Brother Eric. Hi, everybody. Uh, Brother Eric here. My YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 That's Knight with a K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, this has been a, a great conversation, and I, I know Luke mentioned uh, in the beginning that um, – that uh, you know, this has been a long, uh, many hours conversation, but really, it's all filled with questions and answers, and many of which you might not have considered. So it's really a worthwhile thing to check out and look through. It may seem long, but I think if you watch it, it's, it's worth your while. All right, thank you for joining us again, Brother Eric. And next we have Brother Mike. Hello, my name is Mike. I uh, involved a little bit with a YouTube ministry and an online ministry on other sites. Uh, just another defender of the gospel and here to provide any in input and learn as well. And again, thank you, Brother Mike. Thanks for joining us. Okay, let me find where we left off last time. Uh, we are on... Uh, Let's do this. Who's that? Huh. Okay, here we are. Yeah, we're, we're uh, starting Chapter 19. And uh, one of the things that I think we all enjoy about the book, not only does uh, Randy Elkhorn uh, use the scriptures to uh, make his case for his, his viewpoints about heaven, but he, he also, uh, throughout each chapter, uh, has questions. And, and each of these questions is an interesting uh, uh, question to discuss and ponder. So he, um, the question in this chapter is, how will we worship God in heaven? He has a quote here by E.J. Fortman. I, I don't know who E.J. Fortman is, but uh, the quote is, what is the essence of heaven? Got it right here. It is the beautific vision, love, and enjoyment of the triune God. For the three divine persons have an infinity, perfect, an infinitely perfect vision, and love and enjoyment of the divine essence of one another. And in this infinite knowing, loving, and enjoying lies the very life of the triune God, the very essence of their endless and infinite happiness. If the blessed are to be an endlessly and supremely happy, then they must share in the very life of the triune God, in the divine life that makes them endlessly and infinitely happy. Well, uh, I've discussed uh, the Trinity in uh, many of my previous studies, and um, uh, I know Eric's viewpoint of the Trinity. I don't know Mike's yet. Are are you a Trinitarian, or are you see it just some other way? This Godhead. Um, I from looking at the scriptures, it it appears that there you could say that there's three persons, but not God. So it's a very important distinction that that people uh, get confused with. I don't like to use the term Trinity. I don't necessarily uh, think I'm not going to bash on other people for using that term. I uh, just try to stick to the biblical term about it, and there's there's a lot you can get confused 
uh, if you try to uh, a lot of times break it down into metaphors and a lot of it just rests upon faith that we do worship and serve one God who has uh, very um, what's the word I'm looking for very div divine attributes that are beyond our finite mind for an infinite God. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, there are many people I know who um, kind of pull back at the idea of, of the, using the term Trinity. One reason, of course, is that word is not in the Bible, even though we think that the, the, uh, the concept or the doctrine of the Trinity can be proven from the, the scriptures. But since the word's not in the Bible, uh, and some people misunderstand what the Trinity is. Some people th think it's a polytheism. It's belief in three gods. Uh, right. And that, that's not the c correct viewpoint of Trinitarianism. Uh, but uh, so you're not the only one I know who uh, kind of uh, holds back on uh, embracing this word Trinity. Uh, the word that we find in the Bible is, is Godhead. So this Godhead mm -hmm. We know that, that God is one. There's only one God. Amen. And, and we know that, that uh, God is referred to as the Father, and then Jesus Christ is referred to as God, and the Holy Spirit is referred to as God. So, uh, and this is what we call the Godhead, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, modalism says that this one God just changes modes. Sometimes he operates as the Father, sometimes he operates as... Jesus Christ in the flesh, and sometimes he operates as the Holy Spirit. He just change, changes forms and modes of operation. Uh, but the Trinitarian says, no, he is simultaneously existing as three distinct persons. Not separate persons, not separate gods, but distinct persons, uh, yet one God. So the main difference between modalism and Trinitarian is the, the idea that the three are simultaneous, uh, at, uh, as a Trinitarian, and the modalist is that the, the, the three are, he exists only in one form at a time. I but believe, you, uh, sorry. So whichever whichever viewpoint a person holds, as long as they believe that there's one God and that Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is God Almighty, he is eternal, not created, uh, and then, you know, I would not reject them even if they were modalist rather than, rather than Trinitarian. Uh, but the thing that one of the things to me that I've always felt was proof of Trinitarianism is this idea, this quote here of this God, this idea that of the love of God. There is, there is even a verse that says God is love. Now, so the argument is, is if God is love, how can this love even exist unless there's an object? Love cannot be manifest in any way unless there's an object for the love. So if God has eternally existed as love, and and uh, then then he had to be there had to be an object of the love, and therefore there had to be this Trinity, this uh, the, the love that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think that's what this guy here, E. J. Fortman, is referring to when he's talking about uh, they love each other. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This love that's between be, uh, among the Godhead. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that the idea of love, uh, God being love, and, and my point about uh, there has to be an object for the love is a valid point to to uh, show that there's got to be three persons simultaneously existing, uh, giving love and receiving love. Yeah, I'd say I agree with that statement because love is always directed at something. It's always directed at something tangible. It's always directed at either a person or even for some people something. Um, you can't direct love at nothing. It doesn't it, – it has to have an, an objective and an object to love uh, to, to express that love towards. Uh, whether you wrongfully do it you know, towards objects and love objects and things instead of you know, people and God um, – Love in every way is directed uh, at something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he phrases. I'll read this one part again. It says, for the three divine persons have an infinitely perfect vision in love and an enjoyment of the divine essence and of one another. So I think he's kind of making that same point that there's this love that is, is this interchanged 
among the Godhead. You know, otherwise, you couldn't say God has always been love if there was never an, not an object for it. Uh, it says, uh, in heaven, we'll be at home with the God we love and who loves us wholeheartedly. Lovers don't bore each other. People who love God could never be bored in his presence. Remember, the members of the triune Godhead exist in eternal relationship with each other. To see God is to participate in the infinite delight of their communion. I think Randy's agreeing with that point too. It's this communion. Mm -hmm. And there can't be communion with just one God by himself. Or less, I don't want to say one God, but if there, there was a Father but not a Son and Holy Spirit, and the, the Father existed without the other, then there couldn't be any uh, communion. Uh, most people know that we'll worship God in heaven, but they don't grasp how thrilling that will be. Multitudes of God's people of every nation, tribe, people, and language will gather to sing praise to God for his greatness, wisdom, power, grace, and mighty work of redemption. That's uh, Revelation chapter 5. Uh, overwhelmed by his magnificence, we will fall on our faces in unrestrained happiness and say praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's Revelation 7. I think we've we've talked before about how uh, we're going to just be singing, singing holy, 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 and... Uh, uh, and that here's another example of this praise that we'll all have for for God. Uh, and then some, but some people could take that as a negative thing. How could that possibly be construed as a negative thing? Well, we we talked about this earlier. You have some people that that um, are of this mindset that that's all we'll do. That, that that that's all there is to it. That there's nothing else to heaven except for us to sit there just saying. Praising God and saying holy, holy. And while praising God is wonderful, absolutely we're supposed to, he's made us he's made us for much more than that. Not to just stand there. I mean, for instance, he he didn't create us in our state we're in now to just stand there and do nothing except do that. He's created us to do things. He, he when he when he put me into the face of the earth, he didn't tell Adam and Eve, now stand there and just praise me all day long and then fold his arms and just stand there and wait. He didn't do that. He said um, they had a relationship. We know he walked with them in the garden. We know he had a relationship with Adam and Eve. And he gave Adam and Eve's directives. He said, take, you know, told Adam to take the animals and name them. He told them, you know, they were to go through the earth, be fruitful, multiply. They were supposed. So they had other, you know, he wanted them to do other things. And that's how I think it tends to get negative. People think that's all there is to it, and it really limits the understanding of all the things that we're going to be doing in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we continue in this study, we'll be discussing in great detail all of the things, how we will be occupying our time throughout eternity. And, of course, part of that time will be, be worship and praise, praising God. But there are people who think this, this is all you do every second of every moment of all of eternity, and they see this as a tedious, horrible uh, fate. Um, well, that first of all, that's not what we'll be doing all the time. But I, I don't see it as a negative thing. I mean, uh, there are times when I've uh, worshipped God normally in my privacy. Is is in, that it, it gets it's exhilarating when you can and to be in His presence and be able to worship Him. See, I you know I'm glad you said that because I was just about to say the same thing. I think people sell short the idea of what it's going to be like to actually be in His presence. It's going to be a feeling like, unlike anything you've ever experienced in your life. I mean, even when you have accepted Christ, you know, we're still limited on our 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 communion with God. We we are allowed communion with God through Jesus Christ. Now He's opened that door. He's torn the veil. He's allowed us to come in and 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 commune with the Father, and. But at the same time, we're still not there yet. We're still held back by these bodies, these corrupted bodies that are stuck here on earth in the state they're in. And I think people, they, they don't look at that aspect of the future and say to themselves, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, here's me in my perfected state, standing in the presence of God. Will it, will it, when you experience a good thing in this life, you know that feeling that overcomes you. You get the chills. You feel good. You get this great feeling. Imagine the intensity of what it's going to like to be in the presence of the Father. I mean, in his physical presence. 
I think people don't understand the kind of the ecstasy that will be to you as a person to 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 feel this love uh, right there with the yeah. Father. I mean, yeah, I I think the way you you just described it makes me think that I'll flip this around on the on the on the critic, the person that says. Oh, how tedious and boring to be worshiping God all the time! I said, "Well, my regret is that I will be. We won't be able to be, be worshiping all the time. We'll be off doing all kinds of other things too. Right. Uh, we'll have jobs and tasks and missions to to do right. and stuff. But when we actually do have those moments where we actually can be right before God and worship Him, I want more of that." <laughs> okay, uh, people of the world are always striving to celebrate. They must just lack uh, ultimate reasons to celebrate. Uh, I'm sorry, they just lack ultimate reasons to celebrate and therefore find lesser reasons. As Christians, we have, we have those reasons. Our relationship with Jesus and the promise of heaven. Quote, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Unquote. Revelation chapter 21. Does this excite you? If it doesn't, you're not thinking correct. You're not thinking right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, and, and he, he raises the same point I was thinking by that comment. I mean, for a person to say, wow, that'd be boring and tedious, you know, to, to be in the presence of God, just praising him for a long time. Well, where's your heart really? Or do you really want to be with God? I mean, is this, I mean, a lot of, you know, we get into this discussion about people who are going to go to hell because um, they simply reject, at, whether it's out of ignorance or whether it's out of um, just just you know a lack of caring. Um, but there's another side to that too. There's a group of there. There are people in this world, believe it or not, who knowingly shake their fist at God and try to displease him and don't want to be with God out of anger, out of uh, wrong, misplaced anger. And um, there's a, I don't know, they feel like, I guess they feel as though they're sticking it to God because they, you know, they, they feel slighted or they feel angry about something or things that are going on. You have a group of people who actually, and I know it's hard for people to, to, to understand that or to understand why people would be wet that way, but we're told it in Scripture. You have a whole type of people who will reject God outright knowing what they're doing and knowing what they're facing you know uh, uh, one of the things that I've been fighting against uh, on this YouTube ministry for years now is the fact that so many people want to point the finger at other believers and question and challenge their salvation and judge judge whether they're truly saved that led me to make a video and titled I'd just throw something in there. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, especially as a new Christian, the the most problems I've had hasn't been with atheists, it hasn't been with a Wiccan, it hasn't been with a Muslim, it's been with other Christians. Those are the biggest group of people I seem to run into issues with. <laughs> on, on terms of doctrine, on terms of fellowship, on terms whatever it may be, I, I clash the most with other believers. Cool. Well, that, 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 that's, that led me to make my video, Most Christians Make Me Sick. <laughs> Watch that video and you, you'll understand I'm, I'm making your point in there. You, you made some very good points in that video. Uh, but getting back to my point about uh, the idea of judging whether someone else is saved, is uh, uh, I've been fighting against the, this inclination that people have. So many people want to... It, it seems to be like their their gossipy nature, you know, to want to like talk about. I wonder if they're really saved or to challenge it. And I, I always want to guard against that. I, I I've always said that the the only litmus test that I will use to determine if someone's saved is if I ask them on, on what are they basing their salvation, and if their testimony is that they're they're saved simply because of Jesus is their savior, because the, because of trusting and relying on Him rather than you know, a long, long list of other things that they could give. They could say because they repented of their sins, they changed their life, they attended the church, they got water baptized. There's all kinds of things they could give me as an answer, but if they if they give me the correct answer on what, what are you basing your salvation, Jesus is my Savior, I'm trusting Him completely, then then I, that would satisfy me. Now, 
there are things though that uh, you know that make me wonder. Even if someone has the correct testimony, I'm not going to say that they they're not saved. Uh, uh, they, at least they have they know the right answer. But I always wonder how could someone be saved and not just have a great love for their savior. Uh, I, I I've heard people use Jesus's name in, as a uh, just in, in uh, uh, throwing it around without uh, respect and 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 reverence all the time, uh, just as you'd use it in in some in other use uh, using other slang words, you know, uh, right. like an anger that said Jesus Christ this or something. And I, I'm thinking, a professing Christian, someone who believes Jesus is their Savior, I, I could never use his name with with in any other way except complete reverence. And so that kind of a thing, and this is another thing that we're talking about, heaven. How could someone be saved and not have this great desire to be with their Savior and, and think, wow, nothing could be better than that. Right. And so I'm not saying that people who don't share this these, uh, these feelings that I have and that you have, I'm not saying they're not saved, but I certainly wonder, how is that possible? To, to know that Jesus paid for their sins, he created them, and then he loves them so much, he died for them, he gives them eternal life, he has all these wonderful promises for their future, and then they're not in awe and, and just have the greatest love and devotion well, to him. Well and, well, and we have the answer to that, and we've talked about this in previous videos, and the answer to that is people get caught up with the things of the world. They become yeah. their focus, they become the things they look at, they don't keep their eyes on the prize. And as a result, their compass is skewed. They begin to pay attention to the things going on around them more than they're paying attention to what they should be directing things towards. And um, and as a result, the things that they, you know, they begin to hold their treasures here instead of their treasures in heaven. If they're if if they acted as instructed by Jesus and said, you know, heap up for yourselves treasures in heaven, this is the very thing he's talking about. Well, in order to do that, in, in order to you know to direct your treasures in heaven to keep them there, you got to be focused on that in the long term goal. You that that's got to be what you focus on, or else, or else you're wasting your time. Well, why are you? You're not going to focus on things like you're not going to think about things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why, yes, no, Christ, you know, of course. And the, the funny part is you talk about judging people. That's the exact kind of judging that Jesus is saying when he says not to judge. That's the kind of judging he's saying. Saying not to do. He's saying just because a person behaves a certain way, you may not understand. You don't, you sh we shouldn't be hasty. This is what Jesus means. We should not be hasty to judge. He doesn't. He doesn't mean we shouldn't judge any issues at all. That's not what he's saying. And people like to do that too. They like to say, well, you know, I love unbelievers love to throw the um, the few scripture verses they actually know. They love to throw out the well. You don't judge me. You shouldn't judge. You should. But what they don't understand is it's like when we come out and say sin is sin, that's not judging something. That's just agreeing with God. <laughs> that's just saying God has already been the judge of that matter. Right. We're simply agreeing with him. We're not judging you. We're simply telling you what's what. This is the reality of the situation. And uh, I don't know your guys' interpretation on it, but the, the judge not lest he be judged verse, I view that as we uh, are not supposed to judge intent or... Uh, their heart, but but we are, you know. But it, there is other ber verses in the Bible where you know, sp a spiritual man judges all things, but himself right. is judged by no man. Right. We're supposed to, like you said, we're, you know, the the things God has already judged is wrong. We're supposed to not say it's right and pe throw it under the right. rug. Right. So in 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 and in light of that. That's why we have to look at these Christians that, like Luke is talking about, and 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 you, and you see, well, how could they not be, you know, excited about heaven? How could they not be excited about, you know, what we're, you know, what we're talking about here? And like I said, I think it's because it's not so much that they haven't accepted Christ, so much as they're content to stay carnal, they're content to stay babies in Christ, and they don't grow. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, things become mired and murky, and they, they focus on the things here. You know, I, I had that issue again just recently with someone I was talking to on the phone, and, you know, I, I used my line, and Luke, you talked about this before, people think you're nuts. You know, they say, you know, the person said, well, you're still, you know, I said, I was in a bad mood about something that happened. And the person said, "Well, you're still alive." I said, "Yeah, that's the problem." You know, I said, "I want to, I, I want to go to be in heaven. I want to be with the Lord." You know? <laughs> and they really took it hard. And said, "No, don't say that." I said, "Why?" I said, "I want, I want to go home. I want to be home. I want to be where I belong." You know, 
I said, I'm only doing this as a temporary thing, man. I want to get out of here. I want to go. I want to go home. And and they say, well, you know, the first their first response was, well, now I got stuff I got to do here. And when that when I hear that stuff, it's like you were just talking about. It blows my mind. The stuff you got to do here, <laughs> it's like nothing you do here is anywhere near as important. What you're going to be doing with God in eternity. And so I can understand why people, and I think this is where some of the people who they go too far to the other side and begin the finger pointing process and begin to go, okay, you can't be saved. You can't be saved because you're not focused on this stuff. You can't be saved because your treasures aren't you know, in heaven. You can't. It's not that they're not saved, and that's where we shouldn't be hasty to judge the situation. Yeah. It's that their focus is wrong. And a verse that comes to, to mind um, that I was just thinking of here is in Hebrews uh, 11, 1. Now, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think it goes down to, uh, I guess, a lack of faith. They haven't built their faith up in a lot of circumstances because we, we, we have we're trusting in Jesus Christ some uh, a God we have not seen with our physical eyes and it's when for instance I can see a car I it's very easy for me to associate with that and like you said a carnal mindset and not be drawn to the spiritual aspect of things that aren't seen that you know because we, we are commanded to to uh, walk by faith, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I, you know. I, th I think what happens is when you go into that mode and you and your focus is wrong, um, you allow the world to kind of start slip on blinders that they themselves have on, and you begin to be a little more accepting of the things happening in the world that you shouldn't be. You 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 kind of just roll with it with the winds of you know. You, know, you just kind of roll with how things go. You go, you know, the saying "go with the flow." I'm very proud of telling people, "No, I go against the flow. I don't go with the flow," because um, the world just wants you to follow suit and it wants you to go with the rest of the fish. And yeah. if the rest of the fish are going right into a whale's mouth, they don't care. You know, that that's just the rest of the way the fish are going. <laughs> so, related back to the point in the book here we're discussing is that uh, uh, a person, uh, some people, some Christians, don't mm -hmm. seem to be very interested in heaven and even think of it as a, uh, maybe possibly a boring, uh, not a wonderful experience, but tedious and boring and stuff. And uh, uh, and then we're tempted to wonder, are they really a Christian? How could they have that kind of an attitude and, and really be saved? Mm -hmm. Well, we got to understand that uh, when a person believes in Jesus for salvation, they, they get baptized, uh, indwelled, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit of God is living in them, and the Spirit of God wants to transform them and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, help them to grow and mature. But but there are people who who uh, embrace the promptings of the Spirit, and other people are like fighting against it their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the degree someone grows and the rate someone grows varies from individual to individual. And so... Uh, the ideal thing is that we grow to the point that that, uh, that our default mindset is always on the Lord. In other words, my mind should automatically go, thoughts should go on, on the Lord and, and heaven and these godly things uh, as soon as my mind is not required by the mundane things of life. Like if you have a job or if you have a task to perform or something, even while you're doing the job or task, you could have your mind on God. But if your mind has to be absolutely focused for a moment, then once it's freed from that task, the default mindset should ought to be automatically go back, oh, I'm thinking about my Lord and Savior again. And that's, that's the point that I hope that uh, we can all reach through mm -hmm. our spiritual maturity. And, and if that is the case, then we're going to be all excited about being with our Savior in heaven. Absolutely. I find, it says in the book here, I, I find it ironic that many people stereotype life in heaven as an interminable church service. Apparently, church attendance has become synonymous with boredom. Yet meeting God, when it truly happens, will be far more exhilarating than a great meal, a poker game, hunting, gardening, mountain climbing, or watching the Super Bowl. Even if it were true, it isn't that church services must be dull. 
there will be no church services in heaven. The church, that's Christ's people, will be there. But there will be no temple, and as far as we know, no services. Uh, that's in Revelation chapter 21. So we won't have church services, I guess, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe as we go through this book, we'll figure out more about uh, how this is going to take place. Uh, uh, but Randy Alcorn is saying that there's no scriptures that say that we're going to come together at a given time as a group to, to worship, as we do here in this in this world. We uh, uh, It's tradition that on Sunday, is more common than any other day, obviously, Sunday is not a required day, but most Christians want to gather together on Sunday and worship and have fellowship and praise God. Uh, but in heaven, there will be no designated date or t time to gather for that. It will be some other kind of a format. He says, will we always be engaged in worship? Yes and no. If we have a narrow view of worship, the answer is no. But if we have a broad view of worship, the answer is yes. As Cornelius the Nema explains, worship in heaven will be all-encompassing. Quote, no legitimate activity of life, whether in marriage, family, business, play, friendship, education, politics, etc., escapes the claims of Christ's kingship. Certainly, those who live and reign with Christ forever will find the diversity and complexity of their worship of God not less, but richer in the life to come. Every legitimate activity of, newly, of new creaturely life will be included within the life of worship of God's people. I think that goes along with the point I was making, that, uh, that obviously in heaven we should be able to have that state of mind and that state of existence and I'm, I'm saying maybe now we can we can mature to the point where that, that our mind is always on Jesus and if it has to be on something else for a moment it immediately gets back to Jesus I think that's what Paul said uh, meant when he was he said uh, continue instant in prayer continue instant in prayer prayer is just communion with God talking to God and, and, and loving and worshiping God that's prayer and and uh, Continue instant means that you continually and instantly get back to this prayer. Mm -hmm. As soon as your as soon as your mind is uh, is available to go to that, that's where it automatically instantly continues. So in other words, life should be constant prayer, constant mm -hmm. every minute. Now the times that your mind's taken away on other tasks, then that's fine. But but in, once the task is over, instantly continue with the prayer. Do you guys do that? Yeah, uh, I, one of the things I well I can't say I always do that, but um, one of the things I have told people is that you know I I know people one of the ways I see it is I'm I'm constantly communicating with the Lord, you know I'm, I find myself I'll be going through work I'll be in the middle of something something won't go quite right I may say something I shouldn't I'll begin to talk to the Lord say I'm sorry Lord I know I'm not supposed to you know feel that way and be that way I, I I'm sorry about that I you know um, but. You know, I mean, but I, and I tell people all the time, people must think I'm crazy because I go around, talk, it looks like I'm talking to myself, but I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking to God <laughs> through, the, through the process of the day. I'm, I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking to Him. Um, and it's it's just, and that's what the, you know, to me, that's been very telling. All the Christians I've ever been close to, they do a similar thing because it's as if, it's as if really they literally see Him walking with them every day. And he's right there alongside them every day. So he's right there with them in, in a moment when something's going a certain way or I need to talk to him. I stop what I'm doing. I begin – I talk to him. And I, like I said, I'm sure people think I'm bonkers because, you know, they see me sitting there talking to myself, but I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to God. Uh -huh. I, uh, yeah, kind of similar. I try to just acknowledge him and talk to little things throughout the day and – it is very easy to get pulled and get distracted. Like, oh yeah. Like you said at your job. I mean, you know, oh your boss comes up. It's like I got to get these parts out, and and then bam, your your focus is, is not on uh, working for the Lord in in you know being a uh, I guess uh, what's the way to put it? being a ministry. You know, I, I viewed it. I've tried to come at it from that 
I'm a, I'm a ministry. I work in my job. I volunteer. They donate to my ministry so I can go minister to others. You know, type, type of situation. And but back to the point of talking to God. Yeah, I try to uh, memorize a few short hymns too. I try to sing to them throughout the day. And and I, I don't care what people think. <laughs> I I sing throughout the day. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, when Eric was describing his uh, talking to God, it made me think of. Uh, sometimes you'll see someone walking down the street and the, you look at them and you say that person's insane they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're dirty they look like they've been living in the streets and they're talking to themselves and, and they're carrying on and you think that's schizophrenia and now now you see people with the, the bluetooth on their ear and they're walking down the street talking to they nobody. are actually <laughs> talking to somebody <laughs> Yeah, but they are talking to someone, but but, but before you think they're schizophrenic, but, but they're right. actually having a conversation. And then we have Brother Eric, well, he's just walking down the street, he's not schizophrenic, and he's not using a Bluetooth. He's just talking to God all the time, right. because his his mind always goes to, 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 to his Savior, you know? Yeah, because we got better than Bluetooth. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. We got the Bluetooth that never breaks down, you yeah. <laughs> it, it, It's uh, eternal Wi-Fi. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, w will we always be on our faces at Christ's feet, worshiping Him? No, because Scripture says we'll be doing many other things: living in dwelling places, eating and drinking, reigning with Christ, and working for Him. Scripture depicts uh, people standing, walking, traveling in and out the city, and gathering at feasts. When doing these things, we won't be on our faces before Christ. Nevertheless, all that we do will be an act of worship. We'll enjoy full and unbroken fellowship with Christ. At times, this will crescendo into greater heights of praise as we assemble with the multitudes who are also worshiping him. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for, I guess, crescendo. The crescendo, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There is something about worshiping uh, with other believers that this this mass worshiping of many people, the uh, the sa the sound, the vibrations, or the sensation of it is just uh, yeah. It's it's like a crescendo, crescendo. <laughs> You know, it's funny. It's like um, another thing I can equate with that is I find myself when I go into certain places. Uh, or I'm with certain groups, you know. You just feel it's like a warm blanket, you know. You feel comfort, you feel comfort, exactly. you feel um, you feel the love, and you don't want to be away from it. Like you talked about, Luke. You know, we get together our fellowship, our brotherhood that we've developed. Um, you know, the uh, the brothers we have that get together here. Um, that's why we talk so long. You know, we wound up getting caught up, and next thing you know, oh man, it's eleven o'clock. I gotta get to bed. We've been talking more. Because it's that kind of thing, but I think it's going to be in heaven. You know, you don't have all those little things that are pulling you away or, or tying you down with that. It's going to be unhindered fellowship, and I, right. that's a great that's a great word I think because sin it hinders us to good fellowship. It 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 it's always there tugging at you, nagging at you to disrupt good fellowship. So we can't have the kind of fellowship we're going to have in heaven yet. We can have close, but you know, like when I go into a um. Uh, the one Christian bookstore I like to go into, and I'm I'm in there. I just feel so good. I feel at home. I feel like I feel like the spirit's there, you know. And it's like, I hate when I leave those places. It's I get that feeling like I like being here. I'm comfortable. It's like a, it's like I just feel at home, you know. Um, surrounded by by you know all you know the books about the Lord and Bibles and you know and and the other Christians that are coming there and they're trying to find worship stuff and you know and there's worship music that they've got you know playing. I mean, you just you imagine that on a much grander scale because everything we have here is always still you know, st stuck in a rut because of sin. It's not all it can be. It's not everything it could be until we really get there. I heard a good quote one time to uh, the fact that interesting you mentioned sin, like the if uh, the devil can't get us to sin, he'll, he'll get us distracted. I think that's also what happens a lot of the time that to... Uh, Kind of take our our fellowship away. We get we get uh, busy in a schedule or busy in in like a jo job and yeah, we're we're even having a great fellowship. It just has to end because 
like you said, we're you know we're just kind of stuck in in this. The, the word the word you just used, Mike, um, was a, is a perfect word. If you had to wrap up our society today, and it's been this way for some time now, but it's getting worse. If you had to wrap up our society in one word as a descriptive word, I'd say distracted is the best word I would use. Distracted. We are so distracted with so many different things. Fiddling on your phone, listening to your – you're talking to somebody on your Bluetooth while you're driving down the road with your Google glasses on and a sandwich in your hand. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, not, you're, you know, you're not paying attention to anything you're doing. People are crashing into each other because they're texting while they're trying to drive down. It, it really – no, and, and, and it gets worse. You know, it's funny. You know, people always talk about the information age and technology is so wonderful. But why do things get so much worse with it? You know, there's another side of that that comes along with it. Is technology great? Sure, for some in some regards. But when misused, and because we're in this sinful state, we're gonna misuse it. Um, it winds up becoming a super hindrance. And and yes, that that word distracted is the perfect description for for our society today. Mm -hmm. And we're and just an interesting. Just a quick point on technology. I mean, even with the, the modern advancements in technology, that statistics are showing that people are busier than ever. I mean, it hasn't made life Absolutely. simpler. It's made it even more complicated. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, now you have more time, so we'll just pile more work on you. It's like, so it's like, it's it's yeah. like, and, and and we call it multitasking to to make it sound good and great and everything. But in the meantime, you're having a mental breakdown because you can't <laughs> do the things you're trying to do. But but you know, Luke, that goes back to what you were talking about before too, which is is a lot of that. This not paying attention to heaven is a lot of that distractions. Is is a lot of it. Um, you know, like. Mike said, Satan doing the simple, the simplest thing of just distracting your attention away from something. You know, he just, he just, just enough to pull you away because he knows what entices you to be distracted. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, yeah, he'd love to get us to sin and and, and uh, fall into uh, you know backslidden state because see, there's a saying that if if uh, people are into sin. They're not into the, the the word. If people are into the word, they're not into sin. Because if your mind is always pre preoccupied with scriptures, you're far less likely to go out and conduct yourself in that manner. Sure. But, Fair but, enough. If, sure. but if but if you if you're out sinning, you certainly you don't want to look at the Bible because it'll convict you. <laughs> you say, Wait, right, exactly. Right. So, it's it's a, it's you know it's funny you mentioned that we were just talking about that this morning and how when you get away from the word, you get into the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's only one other thing to get into. Yeah. Uh, worship involves more than singing and prayer. I often worship God while reading a book, riding a bike, or taking a walk. I'm worship him, worshiping Him right now as I write, yet too often I'm distracted <laughs> and fail to acknowledge God along the way. In heaven, God will always be first in my thinking. Yeah, see, so Randy Alcorn took your word there, distracted. See, he, he, he had me all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, even now we're told, quote, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. That's in First Thessalonians. Uh, that God expects us to do many other things, such as work, rest, and be with our families, shows that we must be able to be joyful, pray, and give a thanks while doing other things. Yeah. So, I made this point once years ago in a in a video about uh, continue instant in prayer, and. Um, uh, I was saying that look, when we're focused on something, you know, we, we're not going to be in prayer because we got to focus on the job, and, and that. But when the job is over, we should instantly get back in our prayer. And Brain Audi uh, commented and said that well, she she felt that uh, she was able to even be in prayer while she's busy at a task. If she she's it's, she doesn't have to uh, separate, and she's able to focus and do both at the same time. And I think that's what Randy's saying right here. So I, I do think that I, I, I stand corrected that a person can continually be in that state, but we do have the distractions. 
And a lot of times work and other things, things that happen in life, distract us and get our mind off of God, even for a moment. But our, our default should be always to go back and continue instant in this prayer and communion with God. Have you ever spent a day or several hours when you sensed the presence of God as you hiked, worked, gardened, drove, read, or did the dishes? Those are foretastes of heaven. Not because we are doing nothing but worshiping, but because we are worshiping God as we do everything else. In heaven, where everyone worships Jesus, no one says, uh, quote, now we're going to sing two hymns followed by announcements and prayer, unquote. <laughs> the singing isn't ritual, but spontaneous praise. That's in Revelation chapter 5. If someone rescued you and your family from terrible harm, especially at great cost to himself, no one would need to tell you, quote, uh, better say thank you, unquote. <laughs> On your own, you would shower him with praise. Even more will you sing your Savior's praises and tell of his life-saving deeds. It just does seem like a natural response. And when, if a person really doesn't understand the magnitude of what what's happened, that uh, you know we are we have a, a a horrible fate in store for us. We have death, judgment, and then the lake of fire, the second death. This is a horrible fate for everyone, and that is everybody's fate unless they get saved from it. And then God loves us so much that he wants us to be spared from that, and he devises this plan that he will pay the penalty, he'll become a man and pay for our sins so that we can be spared that fate. That's what it is means by being saved. And uh, so we get saved freely when we put our faith in Jesus, and, and he gives us eternal life. So when we understand the magnitude of our fate and that we're spared from that, and instead... Uh, there's this mercy and grace. So a lot of people misunderstand. These words are not interchangeable. God shows us mercy because he spares us from this fate uh, and shows us mercy. We're saved. And yet, then grace is, in, on a, in addition to saving us from that fate, he's so gracious that he's going to pile on us blessings of eternal life in this kingdom of, of heaven on earth forever and ever. And that's how gracious he is. He gives us that. And uh, so mercy is being spared something bad that should happen to you. And grace is be being granted something wonderful that you never deserved. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that really puts heaven into perspective, Luke, what you just said there is that, you know, in heaven, salvation's only the beginning. You know, right. that, that, that's, just, that's just the first piece. That's just the initial piece. That's just getting you in the door. That's just getting you there. Um, mm -hmm. The things that all come along with it afterwards, we don't even we don't even know what's in store. I mean, I mean, it's like I said last time we talked. I think we'll be in a constant state of you know you know ribbing each other with our elbows, going, "Man, I wonder what he's going to do next. I wonder what he's going to do next. This is this is incredible." You know, I mean, he he's that kind of God. You know, he he's he's that kind of um, imaginative, creative mind. He's he he wants to he wants to thrill. He wants to you know. I mean, look at all these things he's created that are so wondrous. I mean, it's right. it's what he's all about. You know, and and not only that, he lives to thrill us. He wants to thrill us. He wants us to be excited. He wants us to have fun. He wants us to laugh and smile and do all those emotional things that he made us to do. Um, you know, our worship. We're talking about worship here. Um, Again, we talked about being stuck and about being kind of shackled by sin, and you know, because of that, even our worship's not what it can be here. It, it's still limited because we still have, you know, when we go to church service, it's a wonderful thing. It's it, we get closer to each other, we fellowship, we feel better in the spirit. You know, we're more united. There's more people in the spirit together, so you feel filled, which is why we get together. Um, but there's still there's things in the background nagging at you and holding you down. Worship of God in heaven, right there without all those things, is going to be such a different experience. It's going to be – you truly will have this unhindered way to, to express your, your love for the Savior. You won't be held back by your sin. Right. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, my, I always wonder how could we not want to just <clears throat> worship and praise and love and serve our Savior now if we truly understand this mercy and grace and salvation if we really understand that why could we should we not just naturally just have this desire I mean it's, it's like this example in the book if uh, if you were in an automobile wreck and your car was burning up and someone risked their own life and pulled you out and saved you I mean it, you would instinctively love them and thank them and and mm -hmm. and uh, you'd always be grateful to them and and uh, this is what Jesus did for us and so much more that we should just it should be just a natural response. Our natural state of mind is praise and thankfulness. Yep. Um, in 2003, when Saddam Hussein's statues were being torn down in Baghdad, a television commentator said something so striking that I wrote it down. He said, quote, these people are used to coming out in the streets and praising Saddam. If they didn't, they were punished. He had a policy of compulsory adulation, unquote. God seeks worshipers. Uh, that's in John chapter 4. God seeks worshipers, but he has no policy of compulsory adulation. His children's response to him is voluntary. Once we see God as he really is, no one will need to beg, threaten, or shame us into praising him. We will overflow in gratitude and praise. We are created to worship God. There's no higher pleasure. At times, we'll lose ourselves in praise, doing nothing but worshiping him. And other times, we'll worship him when we build a cabinet, paint a picture, cook a meal talk with an old friend, take a walk, or throw a ball. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking about something there, and, and it's funny, you know, it's really it's really uncanny how we're kind of thinking of some things, and then right in the book he comes along the lines, and he's, he's writing down what we're thinking, <laughs> because one of the things, you know, we talked about, you know, we'll, we, he said, you know, we'll be on our faces in front of Jesus always, and that's all we'll do. No, of course not. We're not. In fact, one of the things I wanted to point out was it wasn't that way when Jesus came the first time. He didn't have people... Making sure, okay, yeah, everybody just get down on your face in front of me, and that's what you got to do now, and just make sure you just stay there, and that's what I want all day long. I mean, that's not, he didn't do that then. And they take some of the lines, you know, like a, like some of the lines in Scripture where it says, you know, upon seeing him, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. You know, at the uh, every knee shall bow, every, every tongue shall confess to God. That's really not so much directed at us as it is directed at the rest of the world. It's really directed at those people who refuse to do that now. Because why? Because we want to do that. Right. You know, the the thing I think of is in the presence of Christ. You know, I think of my Lord coming again or taking us up in the rapture to be with him. The first thing that comes to my mind, if not like I said before, standing like a deer in the headlights, you know, like kinda <laughs> uh, you know, you know. If not that, the first thing that comes to my mind is like they used to tell us in uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 uh, lacrosse practice. You know, our coach was take a knee. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Take a knee. You know, you know. The Lord comes in. I take a knee. My head goes down. You know. Um, we did that that's in football too. You know, which is which is kind of where in my mind the whole that's where my screen name kind of comes from. You know, I always like the concept of you know, uh, in a lot of the fantasy stories, you know, the knighthoods and the, the honor of the knighthoods, and they and their king comes in and they bow before them and they put their you know and they they have their allegiance to him and they lay down their life for him and and it's it's kind of where that comes from. It's the concept of you know I think of the Lord coming in and here's the king of all kings and he comes in and you you take a knee you bow your head. It's it's just. That those comments are really not so much directed at us to say, well, I'm going to make sure everybody's down on their face and everybody's doing it. It's not so much directed at us as it is towards a world that refuses to do that. And he's kind of saying, oh, don't you worry. You will. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. <laughs> you know. Um, so, I, so those people who think they won't, uh, they will. <laughs> I like how you put that. The, that. That does make a lot of sense, you know, like how the Bible calls us soldiers and... Um, yeah, I, I, I like that uh, that image in my head. Uh, 
like we're, we're I man I just got like this giant image like we're all a bunch of knights and it's like take mm -hmm. take a knee for the king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, like, you know, like, like absolutely. That. In our in our in our spiritual armor, you know, what, what does he yeah. tell us? To gird, gird ourselves in the armor as knights, in the armor of uh, of God, you know. Um, this is what we're told to do. And now, of course, you know, we don't go out there waging actual. Well, in a way, we do wage actual war because we, 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 yeah, we actually do f help. You know, are assisting angels to fight this invisible war that we can't even really see. You know, we're we're really part of that, and um, and people Christians need to think about that. That's it's really an honest to goodness fight that's going on, even though you can't see it. You're you're you know, even if you don't want to be in a war, war has been thrust upon you. It's it's there, whether you want to be involved yeah. in it or not. You can choose to lay there like a you know, like a slug and not do anything, or you can choose you're throw, to like, you're, you're thrown in the fire. Your, yeah, you're yeah you can. Pick up a weapon and fight, you know, yeah. um, and that's what we do. That's, that's that's what we do. I'm glad that you explained your uh, YouTube username, uh, Jesus Knight 72. Mm -hmm. I never really, I, I've often thought about that, what what you meant by that. But so Jesus is your king, mm -hmm. and you're Jesus's knight. Mm -hmm. and, and but what's the 72? Oh, the 72. <laughs> The seventy-two is I had to use that for my. That's my birth year. <laughs> that's, not, that's not seventy-two virgins, is it? Oh uh, no, it's not. Uh, no. I, I, I don't think I'd want that kind of pressure. I, I really don't. I, um, no, but um, no, I think it, no, it was that's my birth year. I did it because I guess up, you know. It, the original, just the name by itself, was taken. I guess somebody took it already. So, uh, so I just kind of said, oh, "I'll put my birth year in there." Oh, uh, um, okay. Uh, but yeah, no, but that's but uh, that is the mindset. It, the mindset is, you know, you gird yourself in the armor of God, and I see us. I really do. I see us on those white horses, you know, in, in armor, you know, with our with our our swords drawn, ready to fight for the king. And uh, and yeah. uh, and you know, it's one of the things I also teach my son. And we're talking about worship here. It's the same thing. It's you know, um, it's about living by a code. You know, being a Christian is about like knights. You know, you live your life by a code. You know, the idea, you let your yes be yes, your no be no. God is saying your word is your bond. I don't expect you to swear because when you say yes, it should mean yes. And when you say no, it should mean no. And if you say you're going to do something, you should do it. And it shouldn't be a thought in somebody's mind that you might not. Right. It, it, there's no need for you to swear. That's that's the way it should be. Your, your, your allegiance to me, your word is your bond. Your honor should be everything to you, and the Lord is our honor. He, he's what gives us honor. Amen. Okay. Um, uh, why worship can't be boring? Some subjects become less interesting over time. Others become more fascinating. Nothing is more fascinating than God. The deeper we probe into His being, the more we want to know. The more we want to know. One song puts it this way: "Quote, as eternity unfolds." The thrill of knowing him will grow. Unquote. We'll never lose our fascination for God as we get to know him better. The thrill of knowing him will never subside. The desire to know him better will motivate everything we do. To imagine that worshiping God could be boring is to impose on heaven our bad experiences of so called worship. Satan is determined to make church boring, and when it is, we assume heaven will be also. But church can be exciting and worship exhilarating. That's what it will be uh, that will be in heaven. We will see God and understand why the angels and other living creatures delight to worship him. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a common misconception too. I mean, I know some people find church boring. I don't. I mean, a, you know, quote unquote church. I mean, I like just like uh, Eric was saying earlier. You know, being with other believers. You know, praising, worshiping God, singing hymns. I I I like that stuff, and I've always liked to sing. But uh, even when I was attending my grandparents' Catholic church, I, I always liked to sing. But as far as fellowship with other well, it probably wasn't very many believers there, but anyway, the the point is, is that uh, that fellowship with other believers that came later. I didn't have a desire to be around uh, God-fearing people until you know my, my this last year of my life. 
Uh, you know, it's f- funny you said that, Mike, because I, I said the same thing. Until I was until I became truly saved, um, I saw church as boring and something I really didn't want to take part of. Um, it was something that well, it was thrust upon me, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. It was I was forced to go to it, and I hated it. But when I became saved, it became a totally different thing for me. It became I, I became very interested to hear what was said about the scriptures. I I, I became well I, the the Bible was to me was oh my gosh I can't imagine a more boring book. Why well, would I want to read the Bible? Oh my goodness, now I want to read the Bible. Um, but then I became saved. The first book that was in my hand was my Bible, and I ever since that day I was like hungry. I just wanted to know more and wanted to know more. It, that's just how God opens your eyes when you truly become saved, and you, the Holy Spirit comes in. When that you, that's one of the things that you really feel when the Holy Spirit comes in. You have a desire to want to learn more. You you really you want to get more of the Word. You you desire the meat, even though you're not ready for it. You know, the uh, the young zealous Christians are they're kind of still on the milk. And they're not ready for the meat yet, just because they're not there yet. But they want the meat, and they kind of—they're pushing for the meat. They want the meat. Yeah. Like their baby teeth aren't in yet, and they're trying. Right. To but the exactly. They're, they're trying to eat pizza like mom and dad are. You know, they want—they want the pizza. You know, but they got to eat the baby food first. You know, it's like, um, it's a perfect description of it because because you you become hungry for it, and um, whether it was in church service. Now, of course, I, I will be in fairness. I'll say some were better than others. I have seen some that I'm like, uh, nah, and, yeah. And then there's other. Others that are, I really feel like the spirit's there, and um, right. and you can really feel the spirit working, and you you can really you really get something from the word, you know. So, I, I think. think uh, go ahead, brother. I, I was just gonna say, I just think a real common uh, misconception is that people associate worship with going to a place, and that's not what worship is. I mean. What worship is on an individual basis, and it it gets better with with other people gathering, each on an individual basis, worshiping God together. It that's what what makes the worship worship. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I you know what? That's a great point, Mike, and and I think people do misconstrue that. I think they do. W- worship is not just standing in a church. And I, I know some people are going to watch this who are not saved, but this is all they see. If television shows something, you see a bunch of Christians in church. They got their hands up and they're and they're singing and they're praising God, and, and that's great and that's wonderful. But that that's not all worship is. That's worship. But worship is so much more than that. Worship is connecting with God on an emotional level, whatever that might be. It's um, it's crying to Him in your moment of need. It's it's um, it's laughing with Him. You know, in moments where you can tell he's done something, and you kind of go, "Oh Lord, I know that was you. I feel you in that. I know that was your doing." And you know, it's that's all worship. It's igno- acknowledging his action in your life, whether it's through tears or laughter or crying to him. That's all worship to God. It's it's all worship. Why? Because rather than going to some other source, you're bringing all you're bringing the real you to him. And that's what God wants. God wants the real you. He doesn't want a fake you. He doesn't want um, a person who, uh, you know, just wants to methodically read their Bible, go to church every Sunday, did it, and think they've paid their dues. That that's not what He wants. He wants the real you. He wants all of you. He wants to know when you're angry. He wants to know when you're sad. He wants to know when you're happy. He wants He wants to have that emotional connection with you, always in your life, in every aspect of your life. The definition I have, I. Uh... I got a short dictionary at the back of my Bible for worship is to honor, to show reverence for. And that goes right back to what Luke was saying, like being instant in prayer, just at any time. And what you said, you know, just going to acknowledge him. I mean, worship is, I view it as any point in time when you're turning your heart and your desires and your intent onto God. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes, I agree. You know, this, this discussion... Uh, has made me think of a, a question that I think is a very interesting question to maybe we can answer it now or maybe uh, some other time. I'd like to maybe pose this to everybody on YouTube to answer this question. And that is, uh, we've probably all had experiences in attending church that we liked and then others that we didn't like. What would really uh, constitute an ideal church service if you were to set the guidelines and lay out the plan for the church service what would be ideal 
Yeah. If it's uh, you need time to think about that, then we can discuss it and maybe next time come up with an answer. But uh, I know that I've had there are some things in church in most of the churches that uh, you're going to go. If you leave your home and drive somewhere and go into a building, there's probably going to be 50 or 100 people there, maybe 500 or 5,000 people there. Maybe if it's a mega church, you'll have 10 or 20,000 people there. But whenever you go into a building with either hundreds or thousands of people, I believe you can have teaching, you can have worship, you can have prayer, but one thing you cannot gain from that size of a congregation is fellowship. Right. Uh, you fellowship only takes place on a in a small group setting. That's where you get to know each other. You grow fond of each other. You interact with each other, and you participate in each other's lives. That's fellowship. Yeah. And uh, so I had a home church service at my house for about seven or eight years, and we had normally five or ten people. The most we ever had was like twenty or twenty-two people attending. It was, and it was that kind of a fellowship, and we we did it in the manner that we we thought that it was ideal for us. And I think this is the model we see in the epistles and in Acts. Right, it talks about the early church. They were all home churches. They were not. No buildings were constructed for the purpose of people going and gathering together. They just did it in people's homes, and uh, I, I think that's a the model in the in the in the. In the Bible is is a good model for us to keep today. And I don't I don't necessarily think it's sinful to have a church building. I believe God has worked through many of them and saved many of them. But on the same token, I believe the devil has too. I mean, there's a lot of people who are trusting salvation upon attendance at a building, yeah. and that's that's a that's a very yeah. Uh, yeah. Incredible I think, I'm, I agree, and I'm like going on with both of you, and I think that um, you know, people won't automatically think when we say that that we're shooting down the idea of going to a place called the church and everything. We're not shooting that down, and there are a lot of good churches out there. There are also a lot of bad churches out there. Um, right. The but the idea is that people need to first understand the concept that biblically the church is not a building. The yes. church, the church is not a structure. The church is the body of Christ. It is us. It is the believers. Right. We are the church. Lies the, the, the buildings could all fall down. I mean, you've got people uh, in China and Russia that have underground churches because they can't worship in the way they want to there. Um, freely, they have to go by orthodox rules. They have to do certain things, or else people will take them. Out. I mean, literally take them and kill them. It happens on a regular basis. You hear about martyrs all the time, and. Would anyone say that those people underground who are who are you know 50 people are trying to share one Bible? I mean, would you would you say that's not a church? Of course not. They, of course it's a church. They're they're a church just as much as we are. They they um you know they they just they live for studying the word and for fellowshipping. I think Luke, what you said was exactly something along the lines I said is to me when you start to lose the personal touch, there's a problem. I think it, it just. When I, I, I can you sum it up mean? pretty good, uh, yeah. you're focused on the quantity instead of the quality. Yes, that's a great way to put it. Qu quality, quantity instead of quality, and that's happening far too much these days. You've you've run into the because what it turns into is it it turns into politics. We've seen it too often. It turns into uh, and that's not something a church was ever supposed to be. Um, you know, the, the idea of a group. Setting like Luke said, that's what I've been doing. I, I I've done church at home for the longest time, and the reason I've done that is because it keeps everything on a very personal level. Personal questions are answered in a in a in an atmosphere of um, some of the larger churches. You may have lots of questions that just never get answered because you're just lost in the in the shuffle of of this this sea of people that's going there, and. Um, it's very hard to to be a, a leader in that kind of environment because you you can't give it that personal touch that, that a leader you know a shepherd is really supposed to give his flock. He he really needs to be able to get in there personally. You know, um, once again the the soldier analogy comes to play. You know, like a like a um, you know in a hierarchy of the military, you've got the commanders that you never see. But it would be ridiculous for everybody to always get together under one general, and you got 
hundreds of thousands of guys. No, it's broken up into smaller groups and smaller groups and smaller groups. Eventually, you get into platoons or flights in the Air Force or whatever, and and they're smaller groups of guys led by a guy, and because it's a much more personal level that the guy can the guy can deal with his men. It's the same type of thing with 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 Christianity. And on a on a smaller note, I think it's better because you can reach everybody personally. It, it, everybody can have their their um, their issues um, dealt with in 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 a, in a better way in a smaller environment like that. I just I just feel that way. I don't know if you guys uh, agree with me or disagree with me on this, but from what I've seen from Scripture, um, yes, you had Jesus hanging out with publicans and sinners, but with the church in general, it seems as if uh, it it was believers fellowshipping with each other, and that was their quote, you know, church worship service, and they would go out to the lost to win them, and once someone was converted then be brought in to their little gathering it the this uh I think it's a more mod it is it's a modern idea to bring a I, I believe to bring a lost person into a building and now I believe you have like these mega churches you I believe there's uh, some people that are safe but there's a lot of people that aren't safe so now you have a giant group of saved and unsaved people lost in like I you best uh See, I thought you expressed it very well there. And who, you know, who, who's who? I mean, who's. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Who's been caught by Jesus and who's, you know, swimming, just swimming freely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, premise that. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure in the scriptures uh, if there was this test that you've. Uh, You've uh, described there, uh, brother Mike, about they, they make sure they're saved before they come in, or, or bring them in and then they get saved. I, I don't know if the scriptures speak of that. that I can recall, but um, well, with the the uh, scriptures that come to mind, especially the evangelism, it's it's always directed go out into the world, go out and preach the gospel. To every I mean, that, that seems to be the instruction to go out, not bite them in. Yeah. I mean, I will. I, I was going to say that even though I'm not sure that it, 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 that is specifically addressed in the scriptures, uh, I know, do know that uh, in church early church history, that it was very common that that's the way it was. That uh, people were, did not become part of the congregation unless they were believers. So you you get them to be a believer, and then they can join the congregation. You don't have unbelievers as part of your congregation, and that's why. Uh, uh, in, in, in our little fellowship here in these discussion groups, uh, I, I'm, I try to be certain that uh, anybody in the group, if we're going to have fellowship, it has to be among believers. And we have to at least agree on the most basic things uh, and then have liberty on many other things that we can learn from each other. But, but at least uh, I don't want anybody coming here and it can't be fellowship if they're, if they're some from other religion or, or an unbeliever. Okay, uh, very interesting. So yeah, maybe give that some thought. I, I might even do another video uh, just posing the question, asking people to uh, describe if they were going to design their own church service, how would they set it up? What would be the format uh, for the ideal church or, or congregation? We know the church is not an organization, it's an organism. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, it, it's made up, the body of Christ is the church, and each person that's, that's a, a safe person is is an or is a cell in the body. Mm -hmm. So it, it's made up of all these cells and making up this organism that is the body of Christ. I'd be you know that's funny. I'd be very interested, very interested to see responses from from people all over the place about that. People who go to what they consider to be a mega church, people who are in smaller churches. I'd really like to see a response by people on that, just to see their honest feeling about how they. You know, to give them the opportunity to say, well, I know our church does it like this, but I'd like to see this. I, I'd be very interested to see that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, a couple main points I just throw out there real quick. I definitely believe that uh, singing spiritual hymns and praises to God should be part of it. And the other part I put on that would be, you know, the Word of God being taught or preached or in some aspect learning and growing in the Word. I, and then the rest, 
I guess you could you could I would have to think about. But those are the two main things I would yeah. probably want to see in a service. Yeah, I, I think that's that'd be correct. But I, I I would like to see the teaching part from the pulpit uh, minimal, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and then, and then I'd like to have be like an open mic for discussions. But the problem is, if you have a really large congregation, mm -hmm. that can be really uh, chaotic. Right. In a small group, though, uh, what we did at my house was it was always open forum. Anybody could raise your hand, ask a question, even in the middle of teaching, raise your hand, ask a question, and have a dialogue. And I think that kind of interaction within the congregation is a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. We've uh, done that at, at my uh, local uh, church I attend, uh, and the morning service is, is not like that, but the evening service normally is where it's a very open dialogue, very uh, just raise your hand, chime in, and I, I like that a lot. That it kind of, everyone kind of gets their own little opinion, and, and we've yeah we've learned we've learned a lot of uh, mis mis uh, quoted uh, scriptures and. So that, that I believe is a necessity, at least in some point, uh, mm -hmm. to just break the confusion because there's a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me see if I can find where I left off. Uh, have you known? Yeah, that's that's where you were. Have, yeah, yeah. Have you known people who couldn't be boring if they tried? <laughs> some people are just fascinating. It seems I could listen to them forever, but not really. Eventually, I'd feel as if I'd gotten enough. But we can never get enough of God. There's Amen. No, Amen. Amen. There's no end to what he knows, no end to what he can do, no end to who he is. He is mesmerizing to the depths of his being, and, and those depths will never be exhausted. No wonder those in heaven always redirect their eyes to him. They don't want to miss anything. <laughs> when Eric was, you were talking earlier, uh, uh, I forgot the word you used, but uh, he wants to thrill us. Yeah, that's right, thrill us. Uh, and uh, he, I'm, I imagine that God gets pleasure out of thrilling us. And, and I, when you were describing that, I was thinking maybe he wants to even like dazzle us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good word if, too. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if if you had the ability to take somebody who is below you in knowledge or ability in something, and you had this great skill or talent, and you'd you'd like, you'd get a pleasure out of like showing it off and showing that you're able what you're able to do. Well, I mean, I, I, even in our limited capacity, I mean, when you see like for instance some of the pictures. Um, uh, that are coming back from the Hubble telescope and stuff of some of these galaxies that are oh. so far out there and everything. Are you are you not dazzled? <laughs> I mean, I am when I see those yeah. images with crystal clarity and you and you find you get the scope of how massive the universe actually is. And um, oh yeah, that's pretty dazzling. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and the fact that he he's continually creating the universe is expanding he isn't stopping creating he's the creator and it's even as he's you know ma micromanaging our situation he's, <laughs> he's continually to uh, create so well, I, 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 find that very I know cool. that point is going to be expressed later in the book too the fact that okay once we know that uh, there's going to be a fervent fire. God's going to destroy all the heavens and the earth after the great white throne judgment and then uh, renew it all and remake it, the new heavens and the new earth. And yet, uh, even at the, after that, uh, the question is, will he continue to, re to create even more? Uh, and that's something else we'll discuss when we get to that point. But uh, yeah, he is God is a creator. Does that mean that he's going to reach at some point where he decides he's no longer want to create anything? <laughs> okay. Uh, at times throughout the day, as I work in my office, I find myself on my knees thanking God for His goodness. When I eat a meal with my wife talk with a friend, or take our dog for a walk, 
I worship God for his goodness. The world is full of praise prompters. The new earth will overflow with them. I found great joy in moments where I've been lost in worship, many of them during church services, but they're too fleeting. If you've ever had a taste of true worship, you crave more of it, not less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so true. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Uh, it, to me, I, that is so true, but it's, I, I've been really quite disappointed in my church life going off to the churches of the of the community and, and sadly it's it's been more disappointing than than thrilling in this respect but 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 at, at those times where it it was right you do you really crave more because it really is exhilarating uh, to, to worship God and and to have a collection uh, a congregation of believers worshiping God together. I think it also gives you a greater appreciation for the for the few times when it does actually work out. It, you know, at least I think so. I think. I mean, right. of course, you want to be more successful with it. Absolutely, we all do. But you know, it's like our failures. Does don't, don't the failures give you a pretty a greater appreciation of your success? You know, I yeah. mean, yeah, you you can't really if if you were successful all the time, that in itself to me would be boring. <laughs> if you're just successful all the time, you know. No. I know it's not the same, uh, um, I guess, subject, but I believe it, it could be used in, in a good comparison. No one, I think it's in Peter, it might be Peter or Paul, but count, you know, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations for the uh, trying of your faith work of patience. You know, the the all the setbacks and all the disappointments that it it allows us to enjoy the you know, small victories when we have something that's worth keeping so much more after we have had all these disappointments and all these, man, you know, I, I went there and I just, I didn't enjoy anything. And, and then you find someplace really good and like, man, I, I can't believe God gave me this. But it, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the worst experience made the better experience even better. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I think the line in Peter was exactly what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I every once in a while use uh, a golf analogy, but, I mean, you dream of being able to play a round where every shot's perfect, but, you know, if every time you could hit the golf ball, it did exactly what you wanted it to, and there was, you know, you could never fail. What right. thrill would that be? It's only right. thrilling because yeah. it's difficult to do, and when you right. pull it off, it's then it's exhilarating. Exactly. I, I like to target shoot, and yeah, yes. it, Same I, don't here. How, I don't know how fun it would be if I could, you know, it'd be cool, but if I could just, you know, close my eyes, bam, hit a bullseye every time. I, I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it would it would take the fun out of any kind of competition, you know. I, I do the same thing. Me and him both shoot, and it's like it's uh, it, it wouldn't if, if if you felt like there was a chance you you couldn't lose. I mean, it wouldn't be that much fun, it, you know. It'd be the, the whole idea behind competition. It's a healthy competition, and the, and the idea once again we keep returning to this idea. Why? Well, because it makes you better. It makes you strive to make yourself shoot better. You know, if, if somebody gets better than you, well, you want to go, you want to try and get better. So you start practicing, you try and get better, perfect your technique, technique a little bit more, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, quote, uh, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. That's Ephesians chapter 5. The music we make isn't congregational singing. It's in our hearts and in our daily lives. Has someone ever done something for you that makes you so grateful that you just can't say, stop saying thank you? This is how we should feel about God. Hmm. Uh, in heaven, worshiping God won't be restricted to a time posted on a sign telling us when to start and stop. It will permeate our lives, energize our bodies, and fuel our imaginations. Yeah, that's always been a, a pet peeve of mine is that uh, uh, 
one of the things about church services, and even even the experience in my home, uh, in the home church, as much as I loved it, uh, I know that some people who attended, uh, they're looking at the clock, and you know they're, you know they're uh, they're, you know, anticipating when they're, when it's going to end, and I I I know you had to have a schedule because people have lives. They have, right. they have to they have to make it fit within their schedule of the other things in their lives, you know, and maybe they have to get home at a certain time and go to bed so they can get up for work, and so I, I realize that, but I often wish that there was no time constraints and no one ever looked at the clock. I mean, just it's like we do uh, after this two-hour discussion group is finished, we continue talking and we're not thinking about the clock or anything. We talk until we uh, something prevents it, but there's no schedule to follow. And that that is wonderful to be able to do it because you want to do it, uh, not because you're obligated to be there from uh, you know uh, 10 a.m. until noon. A little uh, just kind of kind of mention check on the time. A little pet peeve of mine is I see it a lot. The the smartphones. Uh, People constantly checking the time, or che you know, g God forbid, checking uh, like Facebook during church. I'm like, you, really, you you couldn't take uh, an hour to to just you know sing and praise and worship God. I mean, I mean, I'm, I don't go out Distract and like to whipping out the Bible and distractions, distractions. Yes, dist exactly. It goes right back to the distractions and it. And now the distractions aren't even uh, limited to outside. They they're actually you know inside the group of believers to just what during worship. I mean, come on, it's it, well, we're, you know, we're supposed. You know, to, you know, you know what really bothers me about that is a, pa a pastor's job's hard enough. You know, I mean right. that's that's just insulting. It's just, I mean, to do it to anybody. It, well, and this is something. Totally, uh, for anybody watching who's not even a Christian or anything, this is just another thing. It's like gets on my nerves. When you're sitting down with somebody else having lunch, I've been guilty of doing it. Put your phone down. I mean, it's seriously, you can't just put your phone down to have lunch with somebody and pay attention to what they're saying. Right. It's it's so ignorant to pick up your phone in the middle of a conversation, start checking your phone for messages. And I know, you know what, I'm mad because I do it. I've done it. I'm guilty right. of it. And, and I'm trying to make a conscious effort to stop doing that. But seriously, guys, I mean, I mean, cut the cord already. It, it, you right. get to a point where you seriously, this stuff is not, it's not just not good for you. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, I mean, you got to look at this and say, this just ain't good. I mean, this is just something it, to right here. Again, going back, it distracts us from a pers any personal relationship. We become more impersonal than ever. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, I, I've been on, on a couple dates, you know, we were talking about this, I think, in a one of our private chats, but uh, that's that's a deal breaker for me. If if we're especially like first out of the box, we're trying to get to know each other, and you're checking your phone every 10, 15 minutes. Right, right. I'm rude. sorry. It's, uh, rude. it's it, just rude. It, it, it's just plain rude. I'm trying to have a, a real, you know, one to one, a real conversation, not a little, you know, not not saying that what. You have going on your phone isn't important, but it it could it could wait. It can yes. wait. And yeah. these distractions and these distractions keep people from being as excited about heaven as they should be because they're distracted with this life, distracted with the cares of the world, and they they don't see. All you know, take the time. We talked about them in the beginning of the video. Yeah, there's a lot of hours we're pouring into this. Okay. But it's something you should really be interested in. It's something as a Christian you should love to hear about. And if you don't, right. you really need to reevaluate your your compass. You need to really kind of you know get it back to to north, okay? Because it's not it's it's pointing somewhere else. Yeah. And anything other than what's laid upon Christ is going to be burned. I mean, it's not going to stand the test. Yeah. Well, this is a relatively new phenomena that these uh, cell phones, these smartphones that people are, and, and they, uh, the, you know, of course they got even the Bluetooth, and now they've got the phone on the eye, on the eyeglass, I mean, the thing on the eyeglasses. And it's I don't like, like the eye thing. It yeah. Just, yeah, I don't like that either. 
It, but I'm telling, a, I'm telling you right now, I trust in God that there will be no iPhones in heaven, okay? Yes. There won't be any iPhones in heaven. I, I just, I don't know, it's something I've kind of wondered. I'm not trying to get off on a different topic here, but the, you notice the Apple icon logo is, like, you know, similar to the Forbidden Fruit with the little piece missing. <laughs> and I've, heard somebody, I've heard somebody say that before. It's, it's, it's oh, funny. I, I, that's interesting. Yeah, I've uh, <laughs> I, I never I never really uh, put that together. I know what you're talking about, though. So <laughs> I've just kind of wondered that, you know, maybe you know, like technology being the forbidden fruit, or I'm yeah. just speculating, but <laughs> well, that's an interesting uh, thing. Uh, you know, it, even in my generation, some of the people are taken to this quite, uh, quite uh, a lot. And but m mostly, it's the the younger generations. It's just it's just so much part of their lives. And I really agree with you, Mike. I think it's it's rude and disrespectful. And uh, if you're going to have a conversation with someone, you're having lunch or, or to, to get together and visit. Uh, come on, it's just bad manners. Can't you just turn off your phone for an hour? Is it that important? You got to be constantly involved, and you know, it's disrespectful to the person you're supposed to be visiting. Mm -hmm. and, and just like Eric said, I battle with this just as many as other people. I haven't gotten an iPhone, but I have a cheap little Android phone, and it, it is, you know, the, the availability to access information at the push of a button. It's very tempting to, you know, what? Hey, I'm wondering this. Hey, I want to, you know, you know, may, yeah. maybe someone. Messaging me, or you know, it's it is it. It's, and, and I'm guilty of it, just like you were saying. I'm hey, I'm I'm guilty of it. I've done it. I've done it. And I'm and I'm not even really one of these, you know, smartphone freaks, man. I'm I'm not one of these people. It's always te I hate texting. I, I despise texting. So, <laughs> but I find myself still doing it sometimes because people are sending me texts and I have to answer them. So you know, anyway, get back on topic. Sorry, I didn't take us off that, but uh, it just. You know, another thing with the distractions. Okay, um, Christ and his bride. Jonathan Edwards said of people in heaven, quote, As they increase in the knowledge of God and of the works of God, the more they will see of his excellency. And the more they see of his excellency, the more will they love him. And the more they love God, the more delight and happiness uh, will they have in him. Yeah, I think that's a natural sequence of events. Uh, Jesus called his disciples friends in John 15, 15. He likewise regards us with deep affection. Good friendship is characterized by growth. Friendship with the God of heaven has the most room for growth because of his inexhaustible greatness. Yet our relationship with Christ goes even beyond friendship. Quote, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Unquote. Revelation 19, 9. It's amazing enough that we'll be invited to the king's wedding. What's beyond amazing is that we'll be his bride. Think about that for a few million years. <laughs> <laughs> there is an intimacy between husband and wife that includes close friendship, yet also transcends it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this idea of uh, the bride, that uh, I think maybe we'll go into that more as we go on here, but... You know, there's a there's a, a group of people that I call hyper dispensationalists, Paul onlyists, and part of their doctrine is that the uh, uh, Christians are the body of Christ, but the bride of Christ is not Christians. The bride of Christ are Jews, and so it seems that Randy Alcorn uh, agrees that the the bride and the body of Christ are interchangeable terms, and and that's what I think. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? Uh, yes, absolutely. Quick uh, scripture reference, because I recently, as you guys have known, I've been dealing with someone like this. Uh, you go to Ephesians 5, and the whole context of the chapter is talking about uh, a lot of instruction in righteousness for a man and a woman, and uh, how it's to be a representative of Christ and the church, and 
even then at the very verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You know, Christ treating the church as his bride. Mm -hmm. And that is the context of what is used in Ephesians 5. And for people that, they just, I guess, throw out that passage, but that's a very, very strong passage to affirm the truth. And, you know, you, you can go into other... Uh, Eschatol end time eschatology about the Jewish people, but the the fact of the matter is it 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 makes the most sense for us to uh, be the bride and follow the same pattern of uh, uh, the Jewish I guess what's the the wedding ceremony mm -hmm. and, and how everything just pieces together it follows the same lines of us being a bride and yes. the body I yes. mean we become just like it says you shall be Come one flesh, you know. We're going to become one with Christ. I mean, okay. Well, let's uh, let's um, suffice it to say that the three of us are in agreement that the body of Christ and the bride of Christ is the same thing, the same mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. They're interchangeable terms. And if other people think watching this think that the the bride is not the body, then we'll let it go at that. But uh, for the sake of this conversation, we're going to agree with Randy Elkhorn as we continue mm -hmm. on here. Yes. Um, uh, let me see. Where was I? Uh, is it the return of Christ will signal not only the father rescuing his children, but also the bridegroom rescuing his bride. As the church, we're part of the ultimate Cinderella story rescued from a home where we labor, often without appreciation or reward. One day we'll be taken into the arms of the prince and whisked away to live in his palace. When, quote, the wedding of the Lamb has come, unquote, Revelation chapter 19, the new Jerusalem consisting not only of buildings but of God's people will come down out of heaven Quote, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, unquote. That's Revelation chapter 21. Quote, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Revelation chapter 19. The eyes of the universe will be on the bridegroom, but also on the bride for whom he died. I have vivid memories of my wife's and daughter's pure beauty in their wedding dresses. The church, Christ's bride, should likewise be characterized by purity as a fitting gift to our bridegroom. The crown prince who has been us. If I were to ask you, quote, what does the fine linen the bride is wearing stand for? You might be inclined to say, quote, the righteousness of Christ that covers us, unquote. Significantly, however, the text says something different. Quote, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints, unquote. That's Revelation 19.8. It's only because of the bridegroom's work that the chosen princess, the church, can enter the presence of of the of her lord yet her wedding dress is woven through her many acts of faithfulness while away from her bridegroom on the fallen earth the picture is compelling each prayer each gift each hour of fasting each kindness to the needy all of these are the threads that have been woven together into this wedding dress her works have been empowered by the spirit and she has spent her life on earth sewing her wedding dress for the day when she will join to her beloved bridegroom. I like that uh, Randy makes that uh, distinction in, in that, that it's only by Christ that, you know, so to speak, we can even, you know, like start sewing that dress. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, misquote that so often to... Uh, oh, a, d a double talk work salvation is the best way to put it, where it it doesn't, you know, put, putting on that, um, I guess making yourself ready becomes part of salvation process. I've heard that directly, so I, I like mm -hmm. that he he makes that very important distinction. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I like that too. And it's not a very important distinction. It's a uh, critical yes. distinction. Yeah, a, a critical distinction. You, you know what I mean, though. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how important this distinction is. So it's critical. It's uh, like, essential. It's an essential understanding. Right. Uh, this gives us a wonderful reason to stay alive, even though we are apart from our beloved. Why? Because we aren't yet finished sewing our wedding dress. The wedding approaches, yet there's more for us to do uh, to present ourselves pure before our Lord. We're eager for his return, but we don't sit idly by. Part of us wants fewer days between now and the wedding because we're so eager to be with our beloved in our new home. But another part wants more days to prepare, to better prepare for the wedding, to sew our dress through acts of faithful service to God. The imagery is beautiful, but potentially disturbing. A pure bride doesn't want to appear scantily clad at the altar before her beloved bridegroom and a multitude of guests. But if she has been diligent to prepare, her dress will be substantial and complete. I don't know if this is a perfect analogy he's given us. I can see some things uh, uh, because the the uh, I see the dress is not an individual dress each one of us has. It's a it's a dress for the for the it's a uh, a body of believers is the bride. It's not. It's not you or you're the bride and I'm the bride and he's the bride. No, it's it's the church as a whole. It's the right. Body. So it's a collective dress. Right. Kind of like we each have a, a string. <laughs> yeah. Except, right. That's a great. That's a good. A good way to put it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the collective work of the entirety of the church. Yeah. You know, that we're putting together this dress. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll bring the needle. All right. I'll get some thread. <laughs> okay. Uh, absor absorbing but not absorbed. Uh, we must distinguish the biblical promise of seeing God from the beliefs of Buddhism, Hinduism, or New Age mysticism, in which individuality is obliterated or assimilated into nirvana. Though God will be absorbing, we will not be absorbed by Him. Though we may feel lost in God's immensity, we will not lose our identity when we see him. Instead, we will find it. Quote, whosoever loses his life for me will find it. Unquote. Matthew chapter 16. Um, yeah, that's a, that is a, a huge distinction between, um, and to me that, that's also a, a difference in uh, theism and deism. We've talked about this in the past. Mm -hmm. Oh, do we lose them? I'm still here. Oh, we might have lost Luke. Sometimes he does that, and then he'll get. He hasn't done that for a while, but sometimes he'll get, he'll get uh, pulled out, and then he'll come right back in. We'll give him a moment to. We'll give him a moment to come back in. Um, but See, um, this is yeah, 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 distraction. <laughs> exactly. Yep, yep. Satan doesn't like what we're talking about here. He doesn't, doesn't like all this. He's getting some. Somebody out there is getting excited about the whole project, and they, you, don't, you, know, you don't get any um, of this. I'm sorry, you get the pit, and then the lake yep. fire. <laughs> well, one of, one of you, uh, one of the things you talked about is, you know, and one of the things I really found was fascinating. We're talking about the wedding here. Is, um, yeah, there have been people who've really laid out the similarities of the the, the parallels of the story of the church, um, and the parallels to the Jewish wedding. You know, the the processes that go through the betrothal, the get her at some time and take her away to the place he's preparing. Oh, well, there he is. He's back. <laughs> well, um, yeah. You haven't done that in a while. <laughs> I, I don't know at what point uh, you... Uh, I know I was talking and reading and then talking, and then I, I realized that it was like frozen up or something. You, so had, you, had you, just said, me, you had just said something about the difference between theism and deism right? or, or yes. something to that nature. Okay. All right. Well, when he talks about things like Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age mysticism... That is really not theistic. These people are atheists. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it's true. It's it's really New Age philosophy. It's not it's not um, it's not theism. It's not God belief. 
Uh, and, and if someone doesn't understand this distinction, uh, deism means, yes, you do believe that it's not some random chance as far as evolution and no creator. There is a creator, but it's a force or of energy, uh, and, and it is impersonal. Right. Uh, it just created, created, and then it's kind of like put things in motion, and then he doesn't, he, he doesn't interact or participate in any way after that. Right. And it's not a person. It's not a personal deity or theism. It's I not a personal deity that would be some, called theism. I think there's some that believe it is personal. They just they they don't like it. Okay, the God of the Bible. They the one true God. They don't like that particular description of how God would be, and they you know they. It's idolatry what they do. They make a god in their own mind that right. fits. Or, or, or they teach that, or they teach the philosophy that you are your own god, or right. what they call god consciousness. It's yeah. a god, is, god is a person. It's a yeah, Christ, Christ consciousness, where you can like right. work up your own spiritual level, right. and then right. uh, pantheism, where we're all kind of recycled into this big system, right. and, and God right. is just everything. And in mm -hmm. the instead of being the creator of the universe, He is the universe, and that's an, another. Uh, critical uh, mm. difference. So, uh, so these uh, Buddhism and New Age mysticism. I know in Hinduism they believe in uh, personal gods, but they have like mm -hmm. ten thousand of them. Yeah, uh, right. But uh, in uh, New Age mysticism and Buddhism, they do not believe in a personal god. So they're really atheistic. But they are deistic. Right. And so, uh, religions, well, religions like Islam and Christianity so are theistic. They, and uh, Judaism is theistic, right. and uh, Mormonism is theistic, but they're right. polytheistic. Christianity and they, they don't, is don't monotheistic. Kid yourself, don't kid yourself. A atheism is a religion too. I mean, it's it's something. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a belief. System it's a belief faith. system. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it, it, Christianity is theistic. In fact, it is monotheistic. The believing in there's one God, and it's a personal God, and specifically, this God is Jesus Christ. And he is uh, manifest in flesh is Jesus Christ, and we have this Godhead, the Father, is come and the Holy Spirit. So this is the distinction uh, with Christianity and these against these other um, uh, religions. Uh, so he's making the point that in Buddhism uh, and New Age mysticism, you basically get absorbed by God. You become oneness. This oneness, uh, you become one with the Creator, and so you're absorbed, and you're you're no longer yourself. You're just part of the collective. I believe that th this topic could deserve a uh, Bible talk all on its own. There's so much to cover on mm -hmm. on uh, the differences. In fact, I think Luke, I think you actually done some videos on on these topics already. I wasn't sh I wasn't sure how far you got in those uh, cult the cult belief systems, but um... well, uh, I, I talked about Jehovah Witnesses and Mormonism as cults right. okay. uh, because because they're confused with Christianity. Whereas Buddhism is not a cult, uh, my, right. de my definition, because it's not it's not uh, confused or claiming to be a, a sect of Christianity. It's right. Oh, okay. Religion. I got you. Okay. Uh, now he says, uh, "Quote: The people of God will not be absorbed into one, into or partake in an in immediate way of being God." Quote unquote. Quotes Cornelius Venema. Quote, God's uh, people will see him without any of the sinful limitations of the present. No sin-induced stupor, no failure of hearing, no blindness of vision will obscure the beauty of God from their knowledge, unquote. So we will know God exhaustively, but we will know him accurately. We will no longer twist and distort the truth about God. Um... Uh, I guess we should stop here. We got another page or so in this particular chapter, but let's uh, let's leave time to uh, make our conclusions and then our altar call uh, or invitation. So let me make a note that we'll stop here. Sure. Uh, All right, so does anything stick in your mind uh, from uh, the, the discussion to, today? Does anything stand out uh, that needs to be uh, emphasized or clarified? Um, yeah, the one thing that stood out to me was the personal aspect of 
uh, worship and reverence towards God. It's not just a mundane, repetitive thing. It's something that should be uh, encouraged, embraced, and you know, actually uh, to f something we should find fulfillment in as a believer in Christ. So that that's what stood yeah, out to me the most. Mm -hmm. Well, we're. Um, how about you, Eric? Um, how one of the things that stood out to me is um, is how easily <coughs> Satan can uh, distract us away from focusing on these great joys that we have waiting for us, and he can tie us up, um, you know, so much in the things, the weeds of what's happening in the world. That uh, Christians, we talk about this often, and it's a real shame. <clears throat> the Christians don't think, they don't really contemplate heaven in a way that they should. They don't, they don't think about all the possible aspects of it. Um, and it's really, I, I think it's, it's a satanic distraction. It's something he doesn't want you to do that because if people really grasped truly what really is waiting for you in heaven, what heaven is really all about, more people would want to go. <laughs> and um, as a result, he gets a lot more people uh, to not to not follow God, to not accept Christ. Um, as a result, because they just the, the idea of, of heaven in itself keeps them from making that because of the the tediousness and the boredom of what they think it is. Yeah, it's going to be exact opposite. It's going to be awesome. Exactly, it's the exact opposite of that, folks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we've 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 talked about. Um, uh, the, the various reasons that people come to Jesus Christ for this salvation. And, and there are people that uh, come to him because they want to be saved from this judgment and condemnation and this second death in the lake of fire. And uh, I'm, I'm not uh, negating or diminishing the, uh, that as a motivation for, for coming to Jesus. Uh, but, but to me, a, a far greater uh, motivation is if a person really understands the attraction and appeal of heaven, uh, what God has in store for us, uh, uh, those who put our faith in our Savior, Jesus, uh, when a person really begins to understand that, because it is so neglected, so misunderstood, and, and uh, there's so much just absolute ignorance on this subject, that I think that is a far greater um, uh, draw the, to bring people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I would say that to anybody who uh, watched this episode, I hope you go back and watch the previous episodes on this because this is number 15, I think. So this gives us a total of 30 hours talking about heaven. I mean, isn't it amazing that uh, uh, if, if, if we had started off by saying that we're going to talk about heaven and do a study on heaven and we're going to talk for... 30 hours, and we'll, we'll only be halfway through. And people would be saying, how is it possible? There's not that much to be said about heaven. I mean, someone made a comment, two hours on heaven in an episode? That How could you possibly talk about that long? And yet that uh, we are 30 hours in and, and just halfway through. So that there's that much to learn about it. There's that much to be excited about about heaven and I, I hope that uh, if you liked this episode you go back and watch the previous episode so you can really really get excited and understand what uh, the future holds for you. If might, you might take you a while. What's that? <laughs> like who? So, so it might, might take you a while but it'd be worth it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, It'll definitely take you a while to get through it all, but if you find it interesting and you work your, your you spend your time going through it all, uh, I hope you get more and more excited as we are. I'm I, as more the more I talk about this, the more I'm excited about uh, what the future holds for me, and it and and it and I have these promises for my future, not because of anything that I've done to deserve it. Uh, it's only because of Jesus being my Savior that I have this uh, hold on to this promise and I trust it. That's my future. So uh, let's tell the people now uh, ex exactly what they need to do uh, if this is what they desire. If they desire these blessings in eternity, this future uh, that's so exciting and wonderful, well, what do they have to do so that they can they can enjoy this? 
brother, which one wants to go? Go ahead. You know, one of the things that that we talked about a lot today. You know, we talked about how you're we're distracted and we're caught up in the in the mire and the in the muck of this world because of sin. And there's a common idea in the world, and I think it's true. And I think of of all people, is people want to be loved. But in this world of sin that we live in, love that we know can only go so far. It's not it's not love in its best state. And God displayed what real love is in doing a very incredible thing for us. Um, he doesn't want us to go to hell because of our sinful nature. He loves us so much despite all the things we do wrong, the things we do against him, uh, the things we do against each other. He loves us and showed us that love in giving him of himself through Christ and dying in our place so that we would not have to spend eternity away from him. And by Christ's shed blood on the cross, um, love the ultimate love being shown to us all in that act, that single act, um, for a people who not only didn't deserve it, but many who resented him and hated him. Um, that's love that we can't fathom. It's, it's, it's true love that we can't understand. And all we have to simply do to experience love that we talked about today in heaven and seeing God face to face and feeling his love there, it really, on a personal level, face to face, which is something that just is unlike anything we can experience, all we have to do is trust him. All we have to do is trust in the work that Christ did at the cross, his shedding of his blood for our sake to be our sacrifice, our sacrificial lamb for our sins, and that he showed us his authority uh, by resurrecting from the dead and proving it to his followers afterward and to the whole world that he is who he says he was and that he had that authority. That's true love. And we talk about all these things in heaven that we'll get to experience. Do not think that heaven is this limited, very simplistic thing. Heaven is a grand adventure. And Christ, Christ coming for us and dying for us, and our trust in that is done so that we can experience this grand adventure, this thing that we were really designed for, this thing that we were made to do. And that's all that God asks. He just asks that you put all your faith in Christ and what he's done. Amen. Amen. Uh, let me ask about uh, the people who... Uh, who do have faith, uh, but they're putting their faith uh, in their uh, own ability to solve the problem, and, and, and they think that they can, they think that they can uh, appease God, satisfy God, and be reconciled with God because of them changing their lives and becoming religious and doing various religious acts in their life, and somehow. Uh, that they put their faith in their own ability to satisfy God. Well, is that kind of faith going to save them? Um, no, 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 it will not. The Bible says in Isaiah, let me turn here real quick, Isaiah 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our inequities like the wind have taken us away. And then in Ephesians it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, and it's not of ourselves. It is uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And nothing we can do um, can help merit or add on to that gift. It is a gift, that's what the Bible calls it, and he gives it to us, and we freely receive it. We, it's not a reward, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, th I know that there are people that, that believe uh, that, that they can somehow work their way to heaven if they're just good enough that God will be happy with them and he'll give them heaven. Uh, this is probably the, the, the predominant religious viewpoint in the world. Mm -hmm. But right. what we want people to understand is that that system is an absolute failure. No one has been able, to, been able to succeed. I mean, that, that's fine, but you would have to be Jesus. That, that's, the, 
that that that's what's required. You would have to be Jesus and yeah. and be perfectly sinless and not break the law at one point. And yeah, sure, then you can go to heaven. But yeah, the problem is you you aren't Jesus and you aren't sinless. And when you stand before an all holy and just God who does love you, he's he's going to have he's just and he, even though he's love, he's just and he isn't going to be able to let you. Uh, you know, a free pass on on your good works. You know, if you are guilty under the law, a good judge can't just give you a free pass just because you did a bunch of good things. But if you accept the free gift payment of Jesus Christ to pay for your punishment, then you can be led into heaven. Yes. So what we're we're asking people to to understand and do is this: understand and agree that. Uh, you are incapable of getting to heaven through your own efforts. Just throw up your hands in defeat and say, I can't do it. I understand. I'm incapable. No person is capable of getting to heaven based upon their own personal merit. And then, once you realize your hopeless condition, you, you can appreciate what, what God did for you. God said they need to be saved because they can't. Uh, do it on their own. I'm, I'll become a man named Jesus. I'll die for their sins, and therefore that way they can be saved if they put their faith in me. So that's what we're asking you to do is don't put your faith in yourself. Instead, put your faith completely in the Savior, Jesus Christ. If you do that, if you put your faith 100% in him and nothing else, then he gives you eternal life. It's a, it's a gift. It's the greatest gift. It's the greatest love. Amen. So, all, all that's required of you is that you put your faith in him, and he, you'll receive this gift. And if you do that, please make a comment uh, on this video so, so we know that uh, we can expect to celebrate with you in heaven. So uh, thank you for watching. I want to thank the panelists uh, for participating. And uh, bless, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.